My name is Michael Santos, and I have a lot of empathy for anybody who has a loved one in prison. I definitely know the challenges that you're going through. I was incarcerated from August 11th, 1987 until my release in August of 12th, 2013. So I served 26 years in federal prisons of every security level. And that is the reason that I have a lot of knowledge about what's going on in there and what people should be doing if they have a loved one in there to advocate on their behalf. Now, that's what this, this program is going to be about, about if your loved one is in federal prison, what steps could you be taking to advocate in such a way that would help him transition to home confinement? And this video is going to show you the different steps that I would have taken. And these are strategies that, that I use and you may want to choose to use them as well. And the first thing that you've got to know about the importance of self-advocacy. I know that the Bureau of Prisons has put out memorandums on their website that say inmates do not need to file on their own behalf. But my experience of having gone through the system for 26 years is that I always need to advocate. And if, I, if you know something about the Bureau of Prisons, you know that it does not have historically have a reputation or a pattern of being family friendly. My belief has always been that a person needs to bring the pain, meaning put some pressure on uh, the, the, the opposing side. The Bureau of Prisons historically always lived by this mantra that their first concern is preserve the security of the institution. They're always thinking about the institution or the agency first. But as a family member, you are thinking about your loved one first. And you should be thinking about what can I do? What resources are available to me that will help me? And through this video of 25 minutes or so, I'm going to share with you the different strategies that are available. And we will also offer you a resource that you can take to, 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 to guide you on your own self-help directed mission of preparing yourself. So I want to show you exactly what you can get if you download the, the, the product. But in the interim, let's just talk about what it means to, to self-advocate. And the first question may be, do I need a lawyer? So let's understand about that. I don't know what your experience has been in the past with having a lawyer, but a lawyer that works on your behalf is a professional. And they may, you may have been one of the fortunate ones who had an attorney who was zealous in his advocacy for you or for your loved one. But many of the people in prison did not have that experience. And if you go to hire somebody right now, it's going to take a long time to bring that lawyer up to speed with, what, with regard to what's going on. And that lawyer may or may not be available to advocate in the way that you could advocate for yourself. And that's why I, I'm, I'm a big believer on matters of this nature where there's a COVID pandemic going on and the attorney general has issued a memorandum directing the Bureau of Prisons to release people to home confinement for very important reasons. Number one, the, the pandemic is spreading in prisons across the nation. Number two, people in prison are there involuntarily. They can't protect themselves. They have to live within the guidelines and the rubric of the Bureau of Prisons itself, which means uh, they can't practice social distancing. They, many of them may not have access to, to hand washing techniques. Number three, they may not be able to have access to masks that are sanitary. Number four, they're going to have to breathe the air from a thousand people sometimes or more inside of a dorm or inside of an area. They have to eat together. There's just a lot more risk of exposure inside of a prison environment that uh, leaders have, have re represented are really just a petri dish for the spread of this pandemic virus. But because the Attorney General has issued this memorandum invoking the CARES Act, authorizing the Bureau of Prisons to send people to home confinement, even if they haven't served 50% of their time. So these are historic times. And traditionally, in order to take advantage of that, a, a, a person in prison would need to go through the administrative remedy processes. And the, the administrative rem remedy processes are really a it's, some people describe them as a kangaroo court, meaning you file a grievance with your counselor or your case manager. It goes to the warden. 
Um, the warden generally says no. After the warden says no, it goes to the regional office. If you advance the administrative remedy procedure to, to what's called the BP-10, from a BP-9 to a BP-10, and it takes some time to go through the, through the uh, regional process, and then it's generally rejected, and then it goes to the headquarters with a BP-11, um, and somebody in the region will generally reject it. In the best of times, to exhaust administrative remedies takes about, uh, uh, the best of times it's gonna be two months, um, more likely six months. So it takes a while to exhaust these administrative remedies, but we are in historic times right now. You don't have two months to be waiting before you can take the next step. And the next step is to file in federal court using, using a variety of vehicles, maybe a habeas corpus motion, maybe some other vehicle, um, but you've got to find some kind of way to take your grievance outside of the prison system, which has a stated mandate of keeping people locked up and instead putting this into the hands of a federal judge who will have an opportunity to review the case and make a ruling on the case. Now, the, you may want to know, well, how do I do this? How do I do this kind of research? And I know it can be somewhat challenging to figure that out and that's the reason that we've put together this course you can see that we've got three different brands at the top of this at the top of each one of these slides one of them is white collar advice one of them is prison professors one of them is resilient courses and then of course we've got the free itunes podcast that anybody can access and through those i have been presenting in information about what I would do, but I'm inundated with phone calls, thousands of people who are either finding us on Google or on YouTube or on Facebook and are saying, how can I help my husband? What can I do? And it's just impossible for anybody on our team to, to, to give the 20 hours or 25 hours that it is going to take uh, to advocate. And so I, I've created this course that will show you exactly what to do. How do you log in to a system to do some research on what steps you can take. And so this course will show you precisely how to do that. And there's, a, there's actually a video on how would I log into, say for example, Pacer system right here. Um, if you can see my screen right now, I'm going to log into pacer.gov, which is a research arm. Um, and you can find out what's going on in the federal courts. Where, where can I find some information? You would just open account right there. You would go to Advanced Case Locator and, and you would log into your account that you set up and you could find cases. Now you have to know what you're looking for and that's why I've created a rather lengthy video that explains this type of information for anybody who wants to learn. If you don't have any money to hire somebody to do it for you, you've got to have the tools that will help you advocate as you move through this journey. And, you know, some people don't even understand, well, what is a habeas corpus? What, what are the different types of vehicles? How can I go and get this type of information? Well, what most people think of a habeas corpus petition as a 2255. Now, you can, you can look and see it's not terribly complicated to get a 2255. Where can I find, right, a 2255 form for court? Just, you know, just use Google. Find out there. You're going to see motions to vacate, set aside motion under 28 U.S.C. 2255. You can download all of this right from my uh, website if you, if you become a part of the course, and you will learn precisely what you have to use to fill out to bring a case in federal court and get, bring jurisdiction back to the uh, sentencing judge. But in this instance, a 2241 is not the appropriate remedy. A 2255, strike that, a 2255 is not the appropriate remedy. A 2255 is specifically challenging the conviction. So you would be, you would be using this form if you're going to talk about the case not being, your, your, your loved one not being prosecuted in the appropriate way or his, his due press process rights were violated. It's very difficult to prevail on a habeas petition, 2255, but it doesn't mean it's impossible. What is impossible is to get a change if you don't do anything. So, but you have time limits and there are restrictions on when you can, when you can file these types of motions. So you need to research, you need to learn about it. 
And obviously I can't answer that question for anybody at scale where there's thousands of people reaching out to me because every case is specific. So the next, pro the next but, but, but again, a 2255 is just one version of a habeas corpus petition. Another one is the 2241, and that may be the motion that's most appropriate in these circumstances. A 2241 motion, as you will have seen if you've looked at our YouTube channel, because I've got examples of them on there, is to challenge the constitutionality of the confinement itself. So what does that mean? Is, you, are, is the person that you're representing, your, whether it's your husband, your wife, your son, your daughter, your brother, your sister, your friend, does that person, are his constitutional vi uh, rights being violated because of the conditions of his confinement right now? The Eighth Amendment of the Constitution prohibits uh, what's called, um, uh, uh, I, I forgot, <laughs> just escaped me. The Eighth Amendment of the Constitution prohibits cruel and unusual punishment, and that could be construed as a constitutional violation. So if there is a constitutional violation of cruel and unusual punishment, only a federal judge is going to be capable of making that decision. But if you don't give jurisdiction to a judge, he will never have an opportunity to rule on your loved one's case. You've got to introduce the jurisdiction to the judge with this motion called a 2241. And again, you can find a 2241 petition just by asking this wonderful resource. Show me example of a 2241 petition. Okay, you pull that up. There it is. This is directly from the courts. You would go and get one specifically from the jurisdiction where you are going to file. You would fill in the appropriate information. You can see there's a considerable amount of information there, but you would also uh, go a little further than this if you're trying to bring your, your loved one out of a federal prison and to home confinement. And the reason that you would want to do that, do a little bit more, is because you, uh, you, you have to make a very strong and compelling case. You've heard the term before, don't make a federal case out of it. You, and you know, when, when somebody says that, that means don't make it more complicated than it has to be because they're using an analogy. A federal case is complicated. This is a complicated procedure, and so you have to make sure that you're going through the right processes. And if you don't know how to do that, you may want to download this course, which includes um, 18 videos that, that are very specific about where to go and get the right forms. How do I fill them out? Where do I file these motions? Sometimes you will file the motion if it's a 2241 in the district where the person is currently confined. Okay. Sometimes you might choose a different avenue, which we'll get to in a little bit, where you would file your motion with the sentencing court, with the judge that sentenced you. And if that judge is no longer on the bench, then you might go with a uh, you might go and file with the chief judge of that of that district court. So there is just a lot of information to teach. And when people ask me questions, I can't answer them all for the thousands of people that call me, that try to reach out to us. That's why we offer free information at Prison Professors. That's why we have the podcasts that's free. But I'm not going to pretend that it's easy to digest the thousands of hours of content that our team produces. So this is a very specific course that is very specific to show you how I would respond in this type of a pandemic, right? You would have to learn how to file a supporting memorandum and what does it look like? What should it say? How do you articulate the body of law that is supportive of your petition? Because you have to anticipate what's coming. What's coming is going to be the Bureau of Prisons uh, objecting to this effort. So you want to be able to show how do you do uh, a, 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 an approach, how do you respond in such a way that you can eviscerate the arguments of the Bureau of Prisons that are going to say that they operate state-of-the-art healthcare facilities and your loved one is going to be fine. Um, that's what you have to anticipate. You need to have a very strong supporting memorandum to accompany your motion so that when the judge reads it, 
he can he can document he can see that that this is not an original decision there are cases going all around the country for these habeas corpus petitions in fact you will see examples of them in this course where people are getting out of prison or being or either being released to have their sentences cut or they are being transitioned to home confinement based on this very historic time that we're in right now where the attorney general has uh, remove people. And so, you know, the PACER system is going to be a great resource for you to use and to learn if you don't, uh, if you don't know how to find it. And, and this course will give you a walkthrough of the PACER system. And through the PACER system, it will help you find how do you get supporting cases. Again, all of these are videos that I can teach you. I can't put you through all of the knowledge that I've gotten while, while serving 26 years in prison or all of the knowledge that our various team members have, have obtained by going through many years in federal prison. But you will at least have this resource that you can use to guide you as you are moving on your own. And, and so you, you'll also want to know, well, what, what, how am I going to show a sworn declaration so that the judge knows that your loved one has enormous support out there? That's why you would rely upon Title 28, Section 1746, where you are swearing under the penalty of perjury in, in a manner that you're a law-abiding citizen expressing your commitment to support your loved one, to provide him with housing, to, to provide him with uh, sustenance. If he's got a job, you're going to articulate that information as well. You're going to talk about the environment where he is going to live. You are going to talk about the release plan that he would have and why it is safer for, to, to remove this person from the toxic environment of many federal prisons where the virus is spreading faster than anywhere and bring him to serve the remainder of his sentence on home confinement. It doesn't mean you may not pursue a pathway to have a sentence cut, but the fastest uh, approach right now is probably going to be saying, hey, we're not asking for a sentence cut. We'll still serve the time, but we will serve it as a uh, on home confinement as the attorney general has recommended. So you may need to prepare a power of attorney to file these documents on behalf of your loved one because all the prisons that with them being in the state of lockdown uh, and staff members, you know, not be operating at full capacity, they may not even be going, they may not even be able to see your loved one, much less consider why he is a candidate for release to home confinement under the CARES Act, as the attorney general has spoken about. So all of this information is available in this course. Um, I've got a, you can see that it takes me a considerable amount of time to put these together. I have to help you understand what is a 3582 motion for compassionate release. And actually, I see that I have a, 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 um, a typo, so I can actually fix that right in real time. For compassionate release, what is that? OK, why is that authorized right now? Well, we're going to provide you in this case law specifically how the uh, the Congress with the First Step Act amended 3582 to allow your loved one to file a motion for compassionate release based on exigent circumstances like we have right now, which is a pandemic going on across the country. So you've got this going on across the country right now. It's important to file this motion. Historically, you are supposed to go through, you've got to exhaust your administrative remedies before you can pr put forth this 3582, but you're going to have to ask the judge to use his discretion and waive that administrative remedy requirement simply because the time is, 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 is of paramount importance right now. There are people dying in federal prison, and you want to take proactive steps to advocate on behalf of your loved one. That's what this course is about, self-advocacy. So you have to know what type of motion to file, and after you've gone through our course, you will be able to make a more educated guess, uh, estimate of what is the appropriate one for your loved one. If you want to participate in some of our private programs, we do have a, um, a, a Facebook live group where you can get on there and ask questions of our team and where we're going to be happy to respond. We are not lawyers. All of everybody on our team it, uh, includes uh, people that have gone through prison for significantly lo long periods of time, not as long as me. I was in there for 26 years, but you know, we've got a variety of people from white collar offenders that 
that uh, have knowledge about the system to uh, people who have become extremely skillful at jailhouse litigation and filed thousands of these motions. And of course, they're available to help you. But again, it takes 20 hours to put this motion together for somebody with experience. So there's a fee associated with, with hiring somebody to do this for you. You could always go and hire a lawyer to prepare these documents for you. But it, in, in my mind, you're far more effective advocating for yourself in a court of law and, and, and put it for, for this type of a matter. You're far more effective talking about your story because if you do hire a lawyer, you're going to pay for the lawyer's time to get to know uh, the loved one and um, they're going to want to review transcripts. They're going to want to do a lot of research. You can do this on your own because it's important to recognize the, 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 the monumental challenge. Again, it is a federal case. You are introducing a motion into federal court. And the only thing that you can be sure of is if you do nothing, nothing is going to happen. But if you act, if you think in a methodical, deliberate way, what can I do for my loved one? You could advance the ball of getting it in front of a judge who right now doesn't know who that your loved one is, but you can give him a well-structured, well-engineered uh, package that is going to help the judge determine is relief appropriate in this case. Now, what happens after I file a motion? Well, once you file a motion, you have put jurisdiction back into the district court, and that is going to require somebody from the government to respond. That's what I mean when I talk about bringing the pain or putting pressure on your opponent. Because if the government attorney has to respond during this pandemic times, they're going to have to, the government attorney is going to have to talk to the staff members in the prison. And they don't want to do that. The, the staff members in the prison don't want to do that. So you're trying to introduce this pressure so the Bureau of Prisons will, rather than have to deal with this and answer to a federal judge about why they're prison, why they're holding people in, 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 in environments that you may be alleging are violating the Eighth Amendment right to, do, to uh, avoid cruel and unusual punishment, um, you know, that is when you start to get attention. And when you get that attention, you are advocating on behalf of your loved one. The, um, you, the government attorney is going to respond. And when the government attorney responds, you are going to have an opportunity to respond to whatever statement the government attorney said. And you can kind of anticipate what they're going to say. They're going to anticipate that says, oh, we have a remedy in place. It's called administrative remedy. And he didn't go through the administrative remedy. So you should dismiss it on those grounds. Well, you're going to be very well prepared after you go through this course to create an argument to show why you, 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 you did not go through administrative remedies. It's because staff members are not responding even to mail. They're not coming around to talk to your loved one. They're not assessing his complications of health. They've not called to find out if he's got an alternative, uh, which is home confinement. They're not speaking with you. They've gone silent. They've gone dark. And it's important to help a judge understand all of that. So this course is not going to be as fast as I am talking right now, but it is going to show you all the different steps that I would have taken or members of our team would have taken if we were in prison. And I was in prison for 26 years. And you can research me. You know, my name is Michael Santos. I'm all over the internet. And you can learn about my experiences and why I feel uh, uh, qualified to help family members understand during these very difficult times. And in addition to this, I'm also going to give you some bonus videos if you, if you go forward with this course on what is executive clemency, because I think you should be learning a little bit about this process for you if you're going to become an advocate for your loved one, and how do I prepare a petition for commutation. So I will provide all of that information with this course. Um, and uh, there is a fee to produce all of this because it takes time, but it's a lot less money than it costs to hire an attorney. It's certainly a lot less money than it costs to hire somebody from our team to prepare this for you, um, but it is, it, it is a tool that you can use at a, at a really low rate of $197. I think anybody can afford to spend $197 to get all of this information, which I'm producing at less than $10 a video. And if you choose to sign up for some of our ongoing support systems, you can, total, you can do that as well. But I wanted to present this information as quickly as I could. So 
you're gonna, I, I'm producing them right now, and you'll be able to download them right from this website if it makes sense to you. Again, it's $197 for the program. You can buy it right now, and we'll throw in the bonus uh, videos of how to prepare a commutation petition. Um, and uh, if you, anybody buys it, I'm actually going to throw in a second bonus. Of, uh, I'll give you a free copy of my book, Earning Freedom, Conquering a 45-Year Prison Term. But you don't have to spend any money with us. If you just look at our websites on the top, you listen to our podcast, I give away a tremendous amount of information to try and show people you don't have to, during this difficult time of COVID-19, you don't have to wait at home just uh, worrying and being uh, afraid of what's happening to your loved one. You know, you've got to ad become a, an expert at self-advocating. Um, I, I went through this and I was very blessed to have many people advocating on my behalf uh, while I was serving a 45-year sentence of which I served 26 years. That's 9,500 days um, and every day was productive. And all of the lessons that I learned, I share through our various programs with our team. Our team is, um, I don't generally work one-on-one -on -one with the people, but our team members do. And if you want to reach out to them, you've got the contact information right at the bottom of every slide. I just wanted to present this very quick message of what you could get if you purchased our self-advocacy program for $197. You can learn how to start filing a petition for your loved one today.